Good afternoon, I'm Peter Sharoshi. This is Stories from the Frontlines, the reporter's live video sessions on harm reduction responses to the crisis. Today, uh, we will discuss what's the situation in the UK. I have two uh, excellent guests with me, Neat Eastwood from Release UK, uh, human rights and drug policy reform NGO based in London, and Matt Southwell uh, from EuroInputs, the European network of uh, people who use drugs. Both of them have been working in drug policy reform movement for a long time. Neat, Matt, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Hi. 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 Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So before we start to speak about drugs, let's speak a bit about the general COVID situation in the UK. Uh, it seems that your country was really hit hard by this epidemic. So one of the countries with the, the worst death uh, rates. Uh, in Europe, and uh, now we hear from the news that the government is easing the lockdown, so things are getting back to normal, but some people think it's too early. So uh, if you have any opinion on, on like what, what, how do you see the general response to this, this epidemic in the UK? Any of you, please? Well, I, well, I suppose that I would say we probably went, well, I think, I think it's clear we went in two weeks too late. I mean, friends of mine from France and other countries was WhatsApping me saying, what on earth are you doing? And my family definitely locked down much earlier. Than, and I think many people did actually lock down much earlier than the government told us to. The government really underestimated the ability of the British people to comply with the advice and people have really, really complied. Some of our government officials haven't applied, but the British people definitely have. Um, or, or the vast majority of British people have. So I think there's been a real problem in the delayed start. I have to say the public sector response has been really very, very creative and very, very flexible and very responsive. Um, I think the government has been a bit lost and I think they're now compounding it by coming out too early of the epidemic, of the lockdown, I mean. Yeah, I would reflect what Matt says. I mean, I think, you know, certainly at release as an organisation, we were recognising that things were moving very quickly in terms of the pandemic and that the UK was not in a good situation. And in fact, we made a decision to move people to remote working two weeks before the official lockdown. And I think that was largely because we recognized that the people that we provide legal services and drug services to are a really vulnerable group. I mean, these are most of our clients have a history of heroin and crack cocaine use. Um, they have comorbidity, low immune systems, and if they were to um, catch the virus, um, they would suffer the worst aspects of the virus, including death. And, and in fact, unfortunately, we've lost a couple of clients um, during the crisis that we're aware of. Uh, so from our perspective, it was what was responsible. It was making sure that we were protecting the health of the people that we work with. And we didn't want to put them at risk because we were traveling around on the tube or, you know, in contact with people who, who um, could result in one of us getting infected. And, you know, we'd likely be fine, but the clients were our main priority. Um, I think we have real concerns about the fact that we're moving too fast out of the lockdown. And I think many of us in the field are going to continue to work uh, remotely based on those principles of protecting the, the health and well-being of the people that we work with and that we care about. Mm. Neat, you are making a, an online survey to, to assess the situation, the drug situation. Do you have any like preliminary results of that? Um, we're just in the process of uh, analysing it. I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Professor Judith Aldridge from the University of Manchester who's doing that work at the moment. Um, I think in the main, some of the initial results that we, we, we find is that the market has been remarkably resilient. Um, there are regional differences uh, in terms of purity around, uh, for example, heroin and, and crack cocaine. Um, cannabis is the, the most popular drug as usual. Um, and in fact, I think that um, more people are using cannabis, which is not surprising considering how um, anxious this whole situation can be, um, and, and so they're using cannabis to relieve that anxiety. Um, similarly with some of the benzo drugs as well. Um, one of the things that we, we published early on with Vice was the um, behavior of people who supply drugs, which again was very responsible, which is unsurprising. 
Um, but using you know, PPE, um, social distancing, uh, cleaning, uh, the wrapping around drugs. So really taking steps to protect their clients, um, which I think kind of feeds into a kind of wider narrative that we've all been working on for years, which is to try and challenge the idea of the drug dealer as this kind of, you know, dangerous evil person you know they're human beings who are serving a market this market continues under lockdown and like all suppliers they are trying to be responsible in this crisis sorry i unmuted my uh so uh matt you you, you said that you are running a harm reduction program with your organization locally so can you tell us what, what is the situation on the streets? How, 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 did, how did this uh, crisis affect uh, people who use drugs? Yeah, we, we were in a very fortunate situation, which is we've been offered some funding um, to do some development work within the UK on peer-led harm reduction. And in fact, the funding fell to pieces just before the, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic started. But it, it had meant that we'd started to run a pilot in my hometown of Bath, um, following a stock out in the local pharmacy needle and syringe program, which had led to lots of sharing and dangerous practice. So we started to work with some of the local, what we call friendship suppliers. These are people selling drugs, but selling drugs to support their own habits rather than necessarily you know, having um, hotels and you know, living in, in, the, in, in Caribbean islands. These are people you know, struggling themselves to, to survive. So we had a couple of these people starting to give out of these friendship suppliers, giving out needles and syringes. That also provided a platform for our peer-to-peer -peer naloxone distribution as well. So when um, the pandemic arrived, harm reduction services necessarily to protect their staff pulled back, um, started to have social distancing, offering NSP by delivery. So we scaled up our, and it was also very difficult to use the community pharmacy schemes because you had to queue for a long period of time. And then people would only give you one pack of needles and syringes after you queued half an hour for them. And that was really not working for a lot of drug users. So we were able to sort of, um, I think double the number of secondary NSPs we were providing. We had one mobile group of drug suppliers also giving out needles and syringes while they were selling. Two houses were doing it. We had a number of meeting up points also giving out um, uh, needles and syringes. And we also backed it up by running a delivery service as well so that we've been delivering around, picking up in some of the rural areas, um, picking up people who are socially isolating at home, delivering methadone to some of our peers socially isolating at home. So really it's been a really great response and it's led drug users to really start identifying much more overtly as a drug user group and thinking together the first secondary NSP set up by somebody other than myself has also just gone live. So again, it's just, it starts to show this community network process taking place. And we've been recently written to by the Director of Public Health in our local area to thank us for our response. I just read an article in The Independent written by Jan Hamilton, and it says that the UK's drug policy is allowing a social genocide to go unnoticed. So it's like quite, quite a dramatic description of the situation. Do you agree with this or how do you see this? Because I think he's referring to like the unappropriate uh, rules for prescription of uh, opiate substitution medications. So and then the, the system is not based on evidence. And it, it, it is just lets people dry. I think, I think the reality is it's the opposite. In, in fact, what we've had is a highly punitive system in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So when I ran OST services and you know, we had general practitioners and specialist services involved in you know, thousands of people being on OST, you know, we'd started to create a much more flexible system where people were able to focus on positive gain. They didn't have to you know, pretend to be using, not to be using drugs. And we showed people, you know, we created this really dynamic partnership between general practitioners and drug users that was helping people think about progressive change. And then the system seemed to clamp down because the government wanted to focus on criminality. Then there was this big ideological push towards recovery. We've seen a decline in treatment numbers, a rise in overdose deaths, surprise, surprise, because we know these two things often go hand in hand. And suddenly COVID has forced the government to do what they should have, and drug services to do what should have been done all the time. We've got weekly take home. We've got fast access to treatment. We've even got some choice where, now, yes, they prefer people to be on buprenorphine, but if you press, you get onto methadone. So I think you now in some parts of the country, we've even got you no know, heroin assisted treatment as well. So you now 
I think this COVID um, pandemic has shown drug services at their best, in fact, not at their worst. And I think the key is that we need to carry this on beyond COVID. So this is the new normal, not um, going back to the progressive, no, regressive model that we've had for the last 15 years. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. Um, I think what we saw at the start of the crisis was a Herculean approach by drug treatment providers who shifted thousands, I'm talking tens of thousands of people of daily supervised consumption or daily pickups onto weekly or fortnightly scripts. Um, and you know, that is, there are risks involved in that. And I think it, right at the start, the big concerns were around, you know, risk of overdose and diversion. Um, and we've had lots of, Matt, Matt and I are working quite closely together in the UK, and there's a group of us working on um, making sure this model continues post the crisis, post COVID-19, to ensure that people can get access to the treatment that they need and that they are respected within the treatment system. So I think some of those concerns around diversion, for example, didn't, um, they, they didn't come to fruition. People were very much wanting to hold on to their scripts. They weren't selling them. But then there's a conversation about, well, if they are diverting them into the market, is that really a bad thing? Um, and in fact, we had a conversation last week about why is it with this population that we always see it as devious if they divert their, their medication, that they can't be trusted with their medication. How many of us know aunts and uncles and mothers and fathers who give out you know, their sleeping tablets, which are also controlled drugs quite regularly to family members, which is diversion. So why would this group do we sort of diminish that experience, which often, you know, and I think Matt talked about this last week in a meeting, which often can be a very caring approach that you see a friend who is in pain because they're withdrawing. So you give them some of their methadone to take away that pain and to take away those withdrawals. So, it, you know, what we've seen is that the, the concerns that were identified at the start weren't borne out. But what we have heard is really positive feedback from the clients, from people in treatment saying they feel trusted, they feel in charge of their um, own treatment plan. Uh, they like the idea of uh, having key workers phone them up rather than having to trips into town for meetings on a regular basis, which cost bus fares. And often this is a population that hasn't got much income. So I think there are so many positives that have come out. This is the one silver lining that I see from this crisis. And we're working hard with Matt and others and with the drug treatment providers and with academics at the London School of um, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to start to build the evidence base to push for this system to be retained post COVID-19. And that will be a battle, I think, because you'd still have that ideological um, position within government that any liberalization is a way of um, pursuing reforms in the drug laws where actually what we're talking about is good treatment that respects people and meets people where they're at and has them involved in the decisions around what they need in terms of their medication. Mm. It's interesting, it's coming up uh, in, in all discussions uh, in this series that people actually don't want to go back to the normal, let's say the normal, which was before this pandemic, because people working in the drug field think that this crisis opened up new possibilities to breaking down the rules which were outdated. Um, so uh, do, you, do you have any discussions about any new innovative uh, ways how which, which were which, which was not possible before maybe some new opportunities for uh, you know like drug consumption rooms is there any any discussion on that so I think I mean, a couple a couple of issues I mean I think one thing we're starting to think about is what do we mean by the process of supervision and support for people on OST mm -hmm. so one of the arguments of drug treatment providers is we get people to be supervised or at least daily dispensed so that we can keep in touch with them we can uh, help them you know and, and monitor them in case they have problems in reality we make people uh, then have to go to pharmacists where they see other drug users they might see you know, the drug that they might see drug suppliers on the way they might be harassed by someone who wants to buy their prescription on the way out and actually sometimes when we give people take homes and then follow them up virtually we actually offer all of the support without any of the complications that might have previously been in place. And I'm really happy to see drug treatment providers starting to have that sort of conversation about we could do this differently and offer people much better support in the future. 
I think the big missing piece, and again, it's the one of the key areas where government, uh, the Home Office interfere in public health, is where we as the, uh, as the professional field and also as drug users have argued for crack pipe distribution, which is a key missing component of the harm reduction response in the UK, always been important because of hepatitis C, but now doubly important because of COVID-19. And the fact that we can't give crack pipes out to people, so we're giving out advice like this, you know, Euro Emperor leaflet that we've given out you know, in 20 countries in multiple languages. No, there's no point giving advice to people not to share pipes if they don't have pipes to not, you know, so they can actually not share. And the fact that our Home Secretary blocked um, the professional field and Public Health England from going ahead with a crack pipe distribution scheme because it was seen as somehow akin to liberalisation highlights that all too often politicians interfere in drug policy and don't follow the science. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what the discussions in terms of drug consumption rooms um, and, and crack pipes is that real reform in the UK is only possible at local level at the moment. Um, and I don't know what Matt thinks, but I think with this government, it's highly unlikely that we will see national reforms anytime soon. Um, that being said, there is a growing uh, body of professionals, police, public health, local councils, um, those in the medical profession, NHS providers, who are coming together and saying, right, okay, we're not going to get this nationally. We need to stop expending energy focusing on reforms through that mechanism. And what we need to do is work locally. So one of the things this week is the University of Kent, Professor Alex Stevens is bringing together um, people from across the UK to have a webinar on DCRs. And, and to start to look at the evidence base for a, well, not the evidence base, sorry, how we would do this, how would we achieve this, what mechanisms need to be in place in order to protect um, drug treatment providers who are establishing drug consumption rooms uh, through, say, for example, a memorandum of understanding between police, public health and the providers and the local authorities. So that work is, is, is continuing in the UK. We're aware of at least two police areas that we can't say, obviously, um, in a public setting, who are really committed to trying to implement these facilities in the near future. So those conversations around drug policy reform and harm reduction uh, enhancement have not ended in the UK. It's just that we're, we're refocusing on the local rather than the national. Yeah, last time we spoke with Norwegian colleagues and they said that the government there is considering uh, substitution for stimulant users. I mean, it's, it's like very few discussions about this, although I think it would be a really relevant issue to discuss. How, what do you think about this prospect of, of having stimulant substitution programs in the same way as we have opiate substitution programs? We've done it for years in the UK. I mean, I think it, unfortunately it's been minority practice, not majority practice, but we had cocaine prescribing back in the 1960s. Um, uh, um, Dick Pates was prescribing amphetamine, uh, um, dexamphetamine to people using amphetamine sulfate at uh, Cardiff uh, drug cons in, at the Cardiff Addiction Services. So we've had, uh, and then John and John Marks is also prescribing cocaine up in in Liverpool as well. So we have had some good examples around the country. It's always remained very minority practice. However, I think the new UNODC guidelines on the treatment of stimulant use, which you know, they don't talk about as dexamphetamine as a substitute for stimulants, but they do at least acknowledge that it is a good pharmacotherapy. That hopefully I think will provide some support to other people to now look at stimulant prescribing. Um, it's, it's a key logical issue. I mean, Peter Blanken's work here from the Netherlands highlights its effectiveness both for methamphetamine users and for cocaine users. So really, I think, you know, it's, it's a tool that we're not actively using. I mean, there are clearly some concerns around people getting psychosis, but I think Dick Pace's argument was that population that do get um, psychosis in treatment probably would have got psychosis in the community and much better that they got it in a supported environment than uh, abandoned in the, in the street. It's a safe supply of, of all of the substances is a really important conversation and I think you know Matt's absolutely right it's kind of a minority practice within the UK and, and to some degree historical now um, but one of the conversations that again has been emerging because of COVID what we have seen is a significant increase in benzo street benzo use in the UK and certainly there is interest from drug treatment providers of looking to 
prescribing benzos um, to, to substitute street use of the substances. So I think this is another area that we'll see um, developments on in the next few months. As far as I know, the benzos are linked to uh, opiate overdoses as well, right? Opiate overdose deaths, especially in Scotland. So what is the Not situation? The gabapentins, yeah. Mm. So what, what's the situation with overdoses now in the UK and access to naloxone? So we've got very, very high levels of access to, to naloxone. I mean, it's mostly through take home naloxone. I think we've started to realize, particularly after Euroempa did a, a, a sort of peer audit of take home naloxone a couple of years ago, we realized that no, take home naloxone gets us so far, but it really does target the treatment population. And really the population we need to reach is the active drug using population. And that's where peer to peer naloxone is much more effective. Interestingly, in the UK, we've seen actually recovery peer based groups coming in and as part of their giving back to the community, actually doing great work in Glasgow and in the north of England to actually distribute um, naloxone through to the active drug using community. And then groups like my own in, in the west of England, which are more actively based drug user groups, you know, we definitely make sure that naloxone is you know, widely available and it's, you know, people are widely skilled in using it. We had a spate of overdoses last year which two overdose deaths, which caused the police to do some drug testing in our area. We introduced peer-to-peer -peer naloxone and four, three, uh, four lives were saved within the next three months. So I think once we give drug users the skills and the, and the resources, they step up and can save each other's lives. And it just transforms the using community. My peers now are so proud of their capacity to look after each other and care for each other. And uh, naloxone is a core part of the response in our community. Again, I think this is something that's really come out of the, the situation with COVID and the lockdown is, you know, when we did an analysis on the availability of and, and the scale of naloxone provision at release, I think in the most recent port, which was 2018, we estimated that it was only one in three people who were opiate users were actually getting access to it. And prior to the crisis, you know, drug services bought in a huge stock of naloxone and distributed it to really high levels. I suppose the question is, why does it take a global pandemic to do that when the UK had the, has the highest rates of drug-related deaths on record for the seventh year in a row? We account for, what is it, one in three of all overdose deaths in the um, Europe. Um, so why did it take this? I mean, it's great, and I think we're all celebrating that, but we need to continue to remember that this needs to be practiced, whether there's a global pandemic or whether there's not, and we must you know, work to protect the lives of those who are at most at risk of, of overdose. Mm -hmm. and, we must, um, and, we must, and we must systematically plan for it as well, because one of the challenges mm -hmm. is when we have these very erratic patterns of ordering, it also creates problems for the pharmaceutical companies in terms of responding. So one of the things we need to do is start to have a much more consistent model. One of the things we've called for is, is, is a national budget for buying naloxone. Mm -hmm. So actually there, is, uh, there isn't an, well, there's not a penalty on people who actually successfully distribute naloxone. Unfortunately, we've got a very, very localized approach to drug treatment in the UK. So that, and it's in, in reality, that was one of the ways of coping with austerity was to throw everything to the local area. However, as Neve is saying, it does open up this very new opportunity, particularly with police and crime commissioners and local public health officers starting to say, we want our area to do, do things differently. And then it becomes a shift in operational policing and public health policy, not a change in the fundamental law around drug control. Um, one of the, the most vulnerable groups uh, during the pandem pandemic are prisoners. So do you, do you have any information what's happening inside of UK prisons? I've heard that there were some plans to release some prisoners, but I think after it was failed. So do you have any news? It's, it's been woeful. I mean, the government's behavior in this is absolutely disgusting. You know, if we can have Southeast Asian countries releasing tens of thousands of people, and you know, I think the most recent figure that I saw was about 55, that may have just gone up to over a hundred people released. Um, and in fact, this morning, a BBC journalist reported that there is increased cases of COVID within the prison system. I mean, this is a petri dish for the virus itself. And beyond that risk, 
beyond the real risk to health because of the virus is also the conditions that prisoners are having to live in because of the lockdown, 23 hours a day in a cell. They're not getting out for exercise. They're not able to see their family for family visits. They're not able to get properly fed because of the situation in the, the, the canteens where they come to eat. I mean, this is not only a health disaster, it's a human rights disaster. And the fact that we are the UK and we are allowing this to happen is disgraceful. And one of the most egregious things that I think was when they released the rules on who should be released. Um, there are lots of different kind of complex, uh, well, not that complex, but, but rules that would detect, dictate when someone could be released from prison, say they had six months left on their sentence, that type of thing, or it was a non-violent offence. They explicitly excluded juveniles who have been convicted of any drugs offence, including possession, who were in the um, youth uh, custodial estate. You know? And the, the reason they've said this is, well, you know, they were asked, the, the um, Secretary of State for Prisons was asked about this in the, the Parliament and was asked why are, are children specifically excluded and they said well if they're being held um, in custody it will have been a serious offence. That to me again is just a kind of dereliction of duty here. They really just don't care about this population and I think this is again you know the UK has a, a, a lot to be um, ashamed of in this crisis, a lot um, as evidenced by our high rates of, of deaths um, from COVID-19 but this too is one of the, the shameful events, I think. Yeah. Um, what, what about the homeless people? Because they are the other vulnerable groups uh, and the, the, it, it was a real challenge in many cities to provide shelter for, for homeless people. How did, uh, how did the cities manage with this problem in, in the UK? I have to say the homelessness is one of the areas where the UK can I think be very proud of its response. I think that's an area where the, the homeless system has really stepped up. So the government initially put plans in place for 5,000 homeless people to be, or street homeless people to be drawn, drawn off the streets. 14,000 people came forward in an initial wave. Now, many of those dropped away quite quickly because the hostels were really not very good at coping with people with quite severe mental health problems, with no compounding alcohol problems, active injecting going on. And some of these you know, hotels had a thousand people in them and they were quite challenging environments. And I think some people also chose to move into slightly safer spaces on the street, particularly because it was nice weather, there were less people on the street. So there were, for some people that became a, a preferable place to be. There was an attempt by the government then to pass the buck back to local authorities to say, look, we've given you quite a lot of money to, to manage the problems, but they've asked them also to manage huge amounts of different problems. And then they said, well, do you mind housing all these homeless people as well? And the local authorities said, you've got to be crazy. We can't afford to do all of these things you're asking us to do. Then that led to them to say, well, uh, no, that won't be our fault, trying to duck responsibility. The founder of the homeless magazine in the UK, Big Issue, said it would be a human rights violation to put these people back onto the street again, now that we for once in a generation have them all off the streets. And that's led to a very healthy public debate, which I think at the moment is forcing the government to come up with pretty radical solutions to house these people in the short term and to give, give longer term housing. I mean, you know, just seeing some of the peers I know who are now living in hostels. I mean, one young woman who, a woman in her 40s, has been living on the streets now in our area for about 10 years. She said her chest health has just dramatically improved since she one came onto script and two went into a homeless hostel. No, and I think you no, know, that many individual stories happening to thousands and thousands of homeless street homeless people across the UK. And now the public pressure to get them housed. I think that's a good. That's that's one of the silver linings of this epidemic. Pandemic. Yeah, I agree with Matt. It is a silver lining. I, I just want to see the proof in the pudding. <laughs> um, um, I mean, this government's great at announcements, but I, I I'm not sure I trust them enough to follow through. And they put it. You know, the announcement was made Sunday week ago, which was on the same day that Dominic Cummings was being maligned and and quite correctly. Um, criticised in the press. So they make this big announcement, like, look how good we are, look over here. <laughs> um, but, you know, our view is that that's money that was already committed to the homeless, to trying to deal with the homelessness crisis in this country back in January. So it's not new money. 
Um, there's lots of kind of like, we're making promises that 3,000 people will be in permanent accommodation by the end of the year. This is a complex moving situation. And also to what we're seeing in the streets of London, it is an increased new population of people who are homeless, those who have lost their jobs because of the crisis, who have been kicked out of their accommodation. So I mean, our concern is that one, this government hasn't always been great in following through on policies for the most vulnerable. And in fact, with 10 years of austerity under conservative governments, um, successive conservative governments, we've seen more damage to the most vulnerable in our society than arguably we have in the last 50 years. Um, so yeah, I, I like to see the proof is in the pudding. And, and our organization will be working directly with people who are homeless to secure long-term housing with them for them. You know, one motif which uh, came up uh, throughout these discussions we, we made with uh, different countries was that wherever we, we have uh, strong peer involvement, uh, things were going faster and uh, the response was much more effective than, than in countries where there is no, no, there are no strong uh, peer-led organizations. Do you also see that in the UK that, that now this crisis somehow revealed the importance or underlined the importance of, of peer involvement? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, it's been, an, it's been an extraordinary time for us because we mobilised, well, through the 1980s and 90s, we had a lot, a lot of response where drug users you know, ran illegal needle exchanges before you know, the official needle exchanges came into play. You know, there were really dynamic drug user groups across the country doing, you know, working in Moss Side, in, in places where the police couldn't go. There were drug user groups letting their homes be used for secondary NSPs. As we came out of um, that epidemic, Tony Blair came in and started to re-demonise people who use drugs, um, which was when I personally came out in, as a drug user in, in, in objection to that. And then we got caught in this five-year battle, which was where we got caught between the Department of Health and Drug Czar's office, getting into this fight with each other where essentially we became the battering ram and we were destroyed by people who didn't even care enough to oppose us directly. They just used us as a tool to fight each other with and destroyed work that we did putting together 45 drug user groups in, a, in the world's first unified network of all types of drug users. That's then led to the drug users in the UK being very, very reluctant to want to organise together again. We've all tended to return to our local areas and there's been a lot of good local work going on but nobody's really wanted to come back to nationally organised, despite UK drug users playing quite significant roles in input, in Euro input, in various different networks around the place being technical advisors, but we've never had a network. And we were just coming back together again, tentatively thinking about working together, uniting all the different types of recovery, active and service user groups, and then COVID hit. And suddenly it's forced us to talk to each other again, um, well, we were already talking to each other, but it really gave a momentum to talking to get to each other again. And yeah, look, I mean, things have really have really moved forward. It's reminded us of our commitment to each other. It's reminded us of the good work we're all doing back in our local areas. And it's created this sense of solidarity. And also because particularly Release has this particular pivotal role in the UK as one of our longer standing drugs NGOs that has played a role of bringing us all together. And I think that's been we can all rarely say no to release, so it's helped to put aside our objections and come, come together and found a way of working together, which is something I hope will be an enduring legacy of, of COVID-19. I just want to say it's a privilege. It's my favourite Zoom call of every two weeks. <laughs> it's a joy, just all these. And I think what's beautiful about it, I don't know if you agree, Matt, it's just this, it, it, it's people that who had been polarised by policy and by funding mechanisms over the last 10 years because of a push to recovery as defined by abstinence rather than recovery being defined by the individual's own experience. Um, but it's so respectful and there's just such a common, um, sort of common desire to help people who are at the kind of an end of the wedge of all of this, the most vulnerable. And it's a, it's a real joy. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see. And it's a, a real privilege to be on those calls and to, hear all of those brilliant people who know so much more than I do. <laughs> I think, I think it's just that we like we, we I think we've found a way past our differences so we do disagree quite fundamentally on some issues you know the recovery groups you know we jokingly laugh about them as being the happy clappies and you know, they see us as a bunch of junkies all you know committed to our using and, and the fact that we can sort of laugh about that with a British sense of humor 
so that we don't that doesn't become the focus of the difference what brings us together is that we are all in our local areas caring for the drug using community and doing so in very respectful and very dynamic ways and okay we may see our drug use slightly differently from each other we may define active drug use or active addiction or you know, talk about it in different ways but when it comes to the delivery of secondary nsp when it comes to the delivery of peer-to-peer -peer naloxone or crack harm reduction or mutual aid that is has a consistent theme through it which is drug users loving other drug users and for me that what brings us together and i don't care whether people get their own self-support in a different way than i do no, that's that doesn't matter to me so much yeah there, there used to be a lot of discussions in the uk between these two different streams of drug treatment like the recovery harm reduction is is that still a kind of ongoing debate or it's already settled I, th I think it, I think we would say there's probably a re progressive what we would call the progressive recovery movement. I think one of the things as active drug users we've done is we've learned to see the difference between the recovery industry and this recovery self-help movement, and they're different. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to typify them as being the same because they sometimes use similar language, but actually the recovery self-help movement is a group of drug users really caring and looking out for each other and looking, you know, doing. You know, social activities, running cafes, doing mutual aid, doing, you no, know, doing a whole load of things which are really mutually caring and supportive. And interestingly, more and more of them are doing peer led harm reduction. They're, they're taking on the peer to peer naloxone. They're now starting to follow some of our lead in, doing, in terms of doing secondary NSP. And for me, that's really exciting. And you now, look, I think we can we can see past our differences i think sometimes you become so focused on the differences that you lose sight of what actually unites you and i think sometimes when you focus on what unites you the differences seem less important yeah um so it sounded you, you sounded quite optimistic about that you know this crisis brought up a lot of solidarity in society um and how do you see the future uh, I mean, we can we can expect a big economic slowdown and uh, some economic crisis, which can uh, affect our communities. So, how how do you see that? Well, I, look, I think the big danger is the economic crisis. I mean, I think no, it's, it's likely that the economic crisis will kill far more people than COVID nineteen ever did. Um, even though we let COVID nineteen kill far too many people than it should have done in the UK, but even so, I think the financial crisis that comes will. Will kill far more people um, and i think we have a real choice as a society do we use this as a transformational moment around things like uh, the green you know, climate change you know we're going to have lots of people unemployed does this now become a, a way that we green our society and similarly when it comes to drug you no know, drug treatment you know, do we carry on prosecuting people and putting large numbers of people in prison or do we actually realize the huge economic benefits of drug regulation let's bring no legalized cannabis start to have a no a regulated market for all drugs let let us pay for our own drug treatment let's pay for our own harm reduction and probably we could cover social care as well uh, within the profits so why don't we just move to a much more rational society and also involve us in regulating ourselves rather than trying to police us all the time because actually if you look at the growth of cannabis social clubs 30,000 people conservatively in the uk now involved in collective growing and supporting of each other that's what happens when you allow people to respond collectively as communities peer-led naloxone support groups of whatsapp groups going out and caring for each other that's what happens when drug users are trusted people given take-homes and not selling their scripts that's what happens when drug users are trusted and that should be the new new normal if they go backwards well we will lose all of the goodwill that's been built up in this period and i think just to add i mean the, the first response when the crisis hit from drug treatment was harm reduction wasn't it it was like how do we sort out OST? How do we make sure that people have enough injecting equipment to keep them safe? How do we get naloxone out there? That was the first response from everybody. There was, there was and, I, and I feel that that kind of re-embraced harm reduction in a way that it hadn't been for a few years. Now that was happening within the treatment sector anyway. There's been some really significant developments amongst the organizations who delivered drug treatment um, in the UK in the last three or four years, maybe a bit longer. So I think we, we were already kind of moving in that right direction, along with like the recovery groups coming along and, and coalescing around goals that we all share. And that's like people should not be treated as criminals. They should not be criminalized because of their drug use. That, you know, 
we need to treat this as a health issue. That's what's important. So I think there was a kind of rebalancing going on anyway, but COVID just sort of accelerated that to a degree that we wouldn't have maybe experienced without it. Um, I'm really hopeful that we can retain that. I am concerned that the economic crisis will actually lead to more austerity. The government has said that that's not on the cards, but they've had 10 years of it. It's an easy answer for them rather than taxing their friends. Um, equally too, I agree with Matt, I think cannabis regulation it, it is very likely, uh, cannabis legalization, I think that was likely anyway. I think we're looking at a conservative government that is led by someone who is essentially a libertarian, who is close to industry and was having conversations arguably within number 10 with Canadian and US producers who are operating legally. My concern is that that could result in the cannabis clubs, for example, being sort of put, to, you know, sort of decimated by this, that they are sacrificed at the, the, the altar of, you know, capitalism, um, but also to the, the um, opportunity to bring in social equity models. And I, I think most people will know what those are, where we expunge previous records, where we make sure that those who are over-policed and over-imprisoned uh, benefit um, from the market because of their, their previous so-called illegal activity in the cannabis arena. So I think those are the things that we will be fighting for. And I think it will be a bit of a battle because of where this government is at ideologically when it comes to um, economics. So I think that's one of the things. And you know, obviously, one of the things that we expected to happen under COVID was potentially a reduction in, in policing um, in the, the month of the lockdown. And we were shocked to see that, in fact, um, the Metropolitan Police, who are responsible for London, managed to carry out the highest level of stop and searches um, on record for seven years in a month. Like how they did that, we still don't know. That's a pretty amazing outcome. Um, but again, it was black people being targeted. And, you know, obviously we have what's going on in the US with uh, George Floyd's death and, and the, the, the protests and, and the reaction, which we understand that comes from a place of pain and it needs to express itself. And it's awful and this is structural racism. And we're seeing similar things in the UK. Okay, people are not dying at the hands of the police. They have done in the past. They have, they've died at, in police custody. But what we are seeing are black and brown people being targeted by police being handcuffed as a matter of routine. And those things are really concerning. And so I think that conversation within the cannabis regulated um, discussions and the policy developments is, is really important if we want to tackle, I mean, drug policy reform is not going to cure racism in society, but it could ameliorate some of the, the damage by reducing the powers that the police have to harass um, black people in the UK. And I, I, I heard Bruce Alexander, I met with him just before the cannabis uh, legalization in, in Canada, and he was saying to me, I don't support it. I, I actually said, look, I think we are going to lose our small industries. We're going to you know we've built up this really you know, great culture under medicinal cannabis use with this informal regulation and big business is going to come in and swamp this. And of course, he was absolutely right. And I think we need to learn from this in how we think about deregulating. And particularly that's the concern of this government who tend to favour big business models rather than you know, supporting something that might be more health orientated. And particularly we've got an amazing cannabis social club up, club up in the northeast in the TNT side, which is you know, not just running cannabis social club and doing medicinal cannabis advice. They're also running mental health service support. You know, they're having um, you know, welfare, people being some of the most complicated people who mental health services can't respond mm -hmm. are being referred to the cannabis social club for management. Uh, no, and I think no, when we start to see this is what could happen if you start to release. In fact, this was the coalition we brought back at the end of the 1990s to the government to work with the government. So now we are here, we are 15 years later coming back again. And let's hope our government responds a little bit more constructively this time rather than trashing our movement as they did last time. Yeah, yeah thank you for mentioning this. I mean, the cannabis reform issue, because I think it's extremely important, uh, not only in the UK, but all over Europe, we see these discussions and uh, we have been uh, working for cannabis reform for several decades. And now we see that it's coming, but not in a way we would like to see it. And I think we need to have more, uh, more clarity and more discussions in the European level uh, mm. about the, uh, and even after Brexit, we consider you as part of Europe. <laughs> 
thank you. So, so do we. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, Neat and Matt, for, for joining me here today. And thank you for all those who uh, watched us live on Facebook. Please uh, stay with us, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, and stay informed and stay safe. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.